Praise the Lord. Why don't we stand tonight and we'll ask the Lord to have his way here in the service. God is able to meet the needs as uh, we ask him to help us and we call on him. Let's worship the Lord. Why don't we just pray together, ask God to have his way. Father, we love you tonight. Lord, we trust you with our lives. Thank you, Lord, that we have opportunity to come and worship and exalt you. God, have your way. Praise God. Are you glad you're in the house of the Lord this night? Amen. Amen. You may be seated, Brother Seth. Come on. And uh, he's going to lead us in some songs here tonight. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Isn't it good to be in the house of God tonight? Amen. I'm always thankful for an opportunity when I can get in touch with God's house and God's people. It makes a big difference. I've been to some churches where, I mean, if there were God's people there, they were few and far between. And I've been to some places where you could just feel as soon as the service opened up that there was a a mind to worship there. The Bible says that he dwells in the praises of his people. And I believe that that's a promise that if we'll praise Him, that He'll be present. So here tonight, those of you that will, why don't you go ahead and stand. And we're going to start uh, with Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome. In this place, Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Omnipotent Father of mercy and grace, Thou art welcome. Thou art welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, Thou art welcome in this place. Omnipotent Father of mercy and grace, Thou art welcome. Just welcome him here tonight. Go ahead and raise your hand and praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to come into your presence, to come into your house, Lord Jesus. Lord, to experience your faithfulness day by day. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. There's another old course along those same lines, says, I will enter His gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter His courts with praise. Oh, I will say this is the day that 
that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. So I will enter His gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter His courts with praise. And I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. Oh, He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. So I will enter His gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter His courts with praise. I'm going to say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for He has made me glad. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If you have your songbooks there, turn in your Holiness Hymns book to page 18. This is a song that I will be honest, I really don't enjoy playing. <laughs> but I love the words to it. And I love singing it. Love lifted me. Amen. Page 18. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea, he heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now say, am I? Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. All my heart to Him I give, ever to Him I'll cling. In His blessed presence live. Ever his praise is seen. Love so mighty and so true bears my soul's best songs. Faithful, loving service to to him belong. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me, when nothing else could help. in danger look above Jesus completely saves He will lift you by His love 
out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea. Billows his will obey. He your Savior wants to be. Be saved today. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I'm thankful for the love of God. If it wasn't for His love, we would never stand a chance. But by the love of God, He sent His only begotten Son into this world so that you and I might have life and might have it more abundantly. Amen. I am thankful for the love of God. And I know because of His love that I can trust Him. No matter what happens, if the, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 that he who hath given his own son, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? He knows what we have need of. And he's not only able, but he desires to supply and to satisfy our need. And so I can trust him. Amen. Turn with me to page 9. We'll sing, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Praise the Lord. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus Just to take Him at His word Just to rest upon His promise Just to know the saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus, how I how I prove him o'er and o'er, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more, oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood. Just in simple faith to plunge beneath the healthy cleansing blood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Tis sweet to trust in Jesus Just from sin and self to cease Just from Jesus simply take Life and rest and joy and peace Jesus, Jesus, how I trust I'm so glad 
I've learned to trust Him. Precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that Thou art with me, will be with me till the end. Jesus, Jesus, friend, how Come every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy in the Lord, and He will surely give you rest by trusting in His Word. Oh, trust him only trust him only trust him now he will save you he will save you he will save you now tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know thus saith the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I him o'er and o'er, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Let's just lift our hands right here and let's worship Jesus. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the Lord. You can be seated if you'd like. Brother Sean, don't sit down. Stand up there and testify, son. We're glad to see you and Sister Rita. Uh, it's good to be here tonight. Thanks for the blessing of the Lord for keeping us, for protecting and helping us on the road. Thanks for the Yeah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Sister Retha, testify. We're glad to have you.
Yes, we do. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, really good to have y'all here tonight. If we could have the ushers come, we'll take the offering. Um, I hadn't talked to Brother Miles about this. I'm just kind of getting up here acting like I don't know how to run the place. But anyway, I checked with him. He said, just reach into the person in front of you's back pocket, get their wallet, and give to your heart's content. Okay? If you've got any <clears throat> question about whether we need money, you just go up there and look at the building we're, we're building, and it'll, you'll soon figure out we need all the offerings that you could give, but we appreciate uh, that. I don't know if any of y'all drove by there lately, but um, yeah. me and the other senior citizen stonemasons are getting really close to the top yeah. of that thing, and uh, so we are, <clears throat> well, we're right proud, you know what I mean? Go ahead and pray, Brother Seth. Sure. You guys come, or you come, however it worked out, not sure. Praise the Lord. And uh, you guys testify. Amen. Well, I'm thankful to be in the house of the Lord tonight. I'm excited for what the Lord is going to do. I just come to the house expecting something great. It's really weird being here after school has ended, and now I'm here to live. And it's so, so different and new. But I know that the Lord has great plans for this church, and I know that he's going to do something amazing if only we'll allow it, and only if we'll reach out and we'll Extend our hand for him to bless us and use us for his glory. Uh, worship with us as we sing tonight. When responsibility and my everyday needs leave me no time to share. Can I say I really care when I learn to live unselfishly and see the needs beyond what pleases me? Then I can truly say I lived for you today. 
fresh anointing fall on me open up my eyes to see a world beyond my own need to a world that's lost and hurting burden me with an understanding to live beyond walls of complacency let me live beyond my own Should somebody need a hand or someone to understand? Will I turn my head and walk away and say there's just no time today when I learn to feel the urgency and willingly and care for those in need? Then I have truly learned to live. Teach me how to live. Fresh anointing fall on me. Open up my eyes to see a world beyond my own need. To a world that's lost and hurting, burden me with an understanding. To live beyond walls of complacency. Fresh anointing fall on me. Open up my eyes to see a world beyond my own need. To a world that's lost and hurting, burden me with an understanding. To live beyond walls of complacency. Turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 8. I, I know there's a lot of stuff that consumes our thoughts and gets us, uh, you know, focused on a variety of challenges in life, but really, if you're a Christian, you need to remember that your first priority in life is to be used of God. I know that not everybody's called to preach, not everybody's called to teach Sunday school class, but every Christian needs to desire to be used by God in some positive way in the world. It's tr it, uh, uh, inactive Christians are not the will of God. So if... Uh, if it's... Uh, 
going to help you any. I just want you to know you need to be willing to be willing to do something. And if you don't uh, serve the Lord, you will never grow spiritually. I've never known anybody that just didn't try to do something in the kingdom that ever made any spiritual progress. And, uh, and if you don't submit to the will of God, what God tells people they need to do as Christians, you won't ever be any good to do any work. I mean, it just, God can't use you if you're not willing to be the kind of vessel he can use. So uh, I, got a, I got a simple sermon, John chapter 8. I got one verse I'm going to read. It's a, a topical sermon, so I got some other points that I'll make from other passages of Scripture, but this particular verse actually states what I want to talk to you about tonight. John chapter 8 and verse 29. Now this is Jesus speaking. Listen to what he said. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. But this is the part I want you to really listen to. For I do always those things that please him. For I do always those things that please him. Now, I want to talk to you. This is a very simple, very simple subject. I just want to talk to you about how to know what to do. How to know what to do. Jesus said, I do always those things that please him. Now, he's the only one that can truthfully make that statement. I do always those things that please him. The rest of us, you know, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? There's none righteous. No, not one. All we like sheep have gone astray, turned everyone to our own way. And thankfully, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. But Jesus said, I do always those things that please him. But if if you're a serious-minded Christian, once you get saved, then your heart's desire is to please the Lord. You you become Christ-like. You want to always do the things that please Him. And if you don't, then there's a glitch in your program and you need to work on it. Now, now, um, did I make that, that last part there? If you don't, the glitch in your program? I'm just trying to tell you. If you don't want to do what pleases him, you're going to end up in hell. That's, it's just that simple. You have got to want to obey the Lord. And, and if you don't want to, you need to, you need to somehow or another get that prayed through till you do want to. Now, the, the daily challenge that a Christian has to face, though, is how to know what to do. How am I going to know, Brother Taylor, what to do? If I'm supposed to do always those things that please him, how am I going to know what to do? Well, there's, there, there's a lot of choices in life that, that are not heaven or hell issues. I understand that. They're not life or death issues. But nevertheless, God has an opinion about everything you do. And you want to remember that. If you're going to try to please him. He's got an opinion about everything. And you ought to want to know what his opinion is. You ought to know what he wants you to do in any given set of circumstances, whether it's a heaven or hell issue or not. And and, and, uh, your opinion about every important decision in your life really needs to be based on whether or not your choice will please the Lord. What will the Lord think about me doing this? Are y'all following me now? I'm, I'm just telling you, I know young people, they, they, you know, especially, and even old people sometimes, you know, they're, they, they, 
they have a lot of non-essential nonsense spinning around in their head, and they like to do goofy stuff and all that. But you, but you need to be really careful even about that stuff. Would the Lord be pleased with this? Jesus said, I do always those things that please him. And you are supposed to be Christ-like. So you need to ask yourself in everything you do, that, am I doing what pleases him? Now, I always I try to emphasize this because, you know, young people growing up, and I know you all young people feel like I'm rattling your cage, but I really am trying to help you because you're growing up and you're going to make a lot of very important life decisions here shortly. And, and you know, don't, don't always ask the question that the world asks about stuff like that. You know, for example, how much money will I make? You know, a lot of people, that's all they ask when they go to take a job. How much money will I make? Well, that's not the only question you need to be concerned about. Yeah, you got to have money, and oh, wow, I'm all for making as much of it as I can. But the thing of it is, how is this going to affect your church attendance? How is it going to affect your spiritual life? How is it going to affect those things that are really more important than all of that? You need to ask yourself those questions, too. Well, how much will it benefit me, or, 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 or will it make me happy, or, or any other self-centered question? You have got to learn that that is not the first thing on your list when you make decisions. I'm talking to you about how to know what to do. Now, always remember that the first question about the choices of life should always be, what does the Lord think about this? And will the Lord be pleased with the choice I'm about to make? Just always, always have that in front of your mind. I'm going I'm I'm to consider that before I make any decision. You've got to. You, uh, you, will, you won't make it long in Christian service if you don't make that the first, decision, first uh, question you ask yourself when you get ready to, to do stuff. So how are you going to know what to do? You've got you to gotta know that I'll tell you one thing, I'm not going to do something that's going to jeopardize my spiritual life or somebody else's spiritual life. Unfortunately, when we make that, that our rule for decision making, the devil don't like it. So if you make that your rule, I can tell you right now, the devil's not going to want to cooperate with that program, and he's going to try to do everything he can to get you to make wrong decisions. He always does. You just need to expect it. God, that was constantly trying to mess up your decision-making process. Y'all ah, need to listen. I mean, since, since that day the devil put it in Eve's head that she might have better, a better idea about what to do than, than what God said. You know, and when he, remember when he said, yea, hath God said. You know, well, may, may, maybe, you know, what he was insinuating, well, maybe, 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 you know, maybe you got a better idea. Maybe you got a better idea of what's good for your life than what God does. You don't, but the devil will try to tell you you might. Jesus operated on a clear principle. He said, I do always those things that please him. Now, that was where Adam and Eve messed up. But you don't want to mess up. You want to make it always your desire to do what pleases him. And that leaves you no time. If you'll always do the things that please him, you won't have time to do the things that don't. Now, now any help you might possibly get out of this sermon is going to depend on the fact that you want to please God. Now, I'm, I'm just telling you if you, want, if you want, if you want to please the Lord, I'm going to tell you a few things, just basic, you know, cornbread kind of preaching, just regular things that would really help you. But if you are not so worried about that, you're just going to have to endure this in silence. I mean, if you just, if you just, if you just want to live fun and, and live a, a sensual pleasure 24-7, uh, then, then what I'm about to say is not going to help you much. But if you care about where you're going to spend eternity, okay, and if you care about what kind of effect your life is going to have on the people around you, then the basic points I'm about to make is going to be of interest to you. Now remember, the answer to the question, 
How to know what to do. That's what I'm talking about. That's just, that's just a title of the sermon, just a simple question. How to know what to do. And, and the answer to that totally depends on who you care about and who you want to please. Who you care about and who you want to please. That's how you're going to know what to do. Okay, here we go. First, how to, how to know what to do? You need to try to think about things with your renewed mind and not your carnal one. You know, when, when you get saved, the Bible says it's the renewing of your mind. Let's, Romans uh, 6, 24, Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. So when a person gets saved, their mind gets renewed and, they, and, and, and their life changes. It's a new kind of life. I mean, and, 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 and uh, the only way you can do that is, is by the help of God. Now, I want you to understand, I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, but, but we are human. And all humans are basically carnal. That's what carnal means. It just means flesh. It just means human. And, and, and what our flesh desires will overrule all other considerations in your thinking unless you fight it. Okay? I mean, the lure of, 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 of sinful things out there in the world. I mean, why do they have that junk blasted on the billboards? And why does this stuff pop up on your phone? And why is there so much ungodly things available to you? It's because it's, the devil is trying to appeal to your carnal nature because he knows it's weak and it will, it will succumb to it unless you get a hold of enough of God to fight it. I mean, the easiest decision to make is based on the carnal-minded rule that says, if it feels good, do it. I mean, that's, that's, the, way, that's the way the carnal mind thinks, you know. I mean, if, it's a, if, it, I, you know, if I'm going to enjoy it, if it's going to be fun, it's gonna be, I'm going to do that. It takes character and Christian, Christian desire to be able to break out of that. I mean, fallen human nature is masterful, though, at justifying its actions. I'm just telling you. I mean, I mean, I've, I've been around pastors long enough. A divorce, abortion, adultery, a child abuse. I mean, have all been justified by somebody just because they thought up some carnal excuse. It's amazing how 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 agile the carnal mind is at being able to come up with excuses. And it's also amazing how messed up society is to help justify those things. If you, if you want to find some, some uh, body to, to, to justify something really wicked, all you got to do is get on the internet. It's amazing how crazy the world is. So you need to try to think about things with your renewed mind, not with a carnal one. If you think to be carnally minded is death, that means you're, you're going to die lost and you're going to go out into eternity and, and, and spend the rest of it in hell if you think with just your carnal thinking. I mean, the Bible warns us in, in, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12, it says that one of the characteristics of the last days is going to be people's desire to believe the devil's lie. You know why that is? Because the devil tells them exactly what their carnal mind wants to hear. You know, if somebody's telling you what you want to hear, that's, I mean, get, come on with that. We like that, don't we? I mean, somebody to, somebody to pat us on the back all the way down to the pit. That's exactly what the devil does. It's, it, listen, listen to what the scripture said. It says, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And that, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, that's what the Bible says. So the problem with them, with them is, is because they would not receive a love for the truth. God wants to put a love for the truth in your heart. But if you won't receive that, you wind up loving everything but the truth. There's nowhere to go from there but down. That passage of scripture that I just read is telling us that the devil's trying to take advantage of us through carnal thinking. 
And all of us have the capacity to think carnal. I mean, you're in a, you're, you're in a, car, you're in a fleshly body. You got a carnal mind, you got a spiritual mind, and you have got to work to make sure that the spiritual mind does your thinking for you, or you are going to be carnally minded about every decision you make. I mean, that passage of scripture is telling us that the devil's trying to take advantage of us through carnal thinking. And 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 and, and listen. Some of y'all need to wake up to what the devil is trying to do to you. It's, it, 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 I, I'm, not, I'm not one of them guys that's always trying to talk about the boogeyman to keep you scared and all that stuff. That's not, that's not the case. I'm telling you the truth. This is the way the devil operates. And the Bible says that in the last days, it's going to get worse. So that means that the pressure is being turned up. And if you think somehow or another that you that that you've been you, you're you know you're immune to it, you're wrong. I, the devil's working on every one of us. He works on me, he works on Brother Miles, he works on all the deacons, he works on the Sunday school teachers, he works on your mom and dad, and he's working on you. He don't he don't leave anybody alone. And, and the weaker your spiritual life is, the more he can take advantage of you. That's why it's important. That's why the Bible says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. You may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. I mean, that's why the Bible says that stuff. Is because if you don't, you won't be able to stand against the tricks that guy's trying to pull on you. How to know what to do. Second, you need to try and find out what God's word says to you or says you should do in the situation that you're facing. Okay, now listen to this. 1 John 2, verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Uh, what does that mean? That means that if you love the world, it crowds out your love for God. That's what happens. It's just like, it's just like uh, you know, you can't, you know, like the Bible says, you can't serve two masters. You either love one, hate the other. I mean, if you get the really love in the world, then all the love you had for God is moved out. And you might be able to sit there and say, well, now, Brother Taylor, I love God. And you done hurt my feelings and you offended me. I don't, I, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings or offend you. I'm just telling you what the Bible said. Nobody can serve two masters. Now, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So try and find out what God's word says you should do in a situation that you're facing. Don't go blundering through to, through your day uh, and, and, and today life uh, like there's no rule book to go by. You don't have to wonder about some things, whether they're right or wrong, or a good thing to do or a bad thing to do. you got information. You need to read your Bible. It's universally understood that the, that the world operates by law. Did you know that? You say, oh, you know, law. No, no. From the law of gravity to the speed limit, it operates on law. If you didn't have any law, it'd be, it'd be bad showing sure up. But most important law is the law of God. And John states in, 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 in 1 John 2.17 that doing the will of God is the key to having a life that ends up in heaven for eternity. And the world passes away in the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God shall abide forever. If you want to do, if you want to make it to heaven, you obey the law of God. That's why... The, you know, if anybody ever asks you, well, why in the world do you get up there and preach, preach all the time, preach every service, read some text out of the Bible? That's why I tell my Bible school students, I tell, you know, in, in homiletics class, I tell them, don't, don't get up there and rattle off a bunch of notions that you got in your head. Read something out of the Bible and preach to them something out of the Bible because that's the only thing that's going to make any real eternal difference. The word of the Lord will abide forever. And all of your notions are going to pass away. Now listen, listen to this statement again. Try and find out what God's word says you should do in the situation you are facing. Now I want to I 
press that with you because some of y'all are facing situations. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm aware of them because I'm not. But I'm just saying I know how life is. And there is constantly situations come up where you have to make a decision. And you need the Word of God to help you to be able to do that. I mean, everybody in this room is facing things that are complicated and distressing. Huh? I mean, life, life decisions are not easy to make. I mean, whether you're a kid or a parent or a teenager, you're, you're all, we're all in the same boat. We're constantly bombarded in, in life with decisions that are tough. And that's why we all need to to hear sermons, go to Sunday school, have our own private devotions because man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I I can't overemphasize the importance of of getting, getting the word of God in your life daily, on a daily basis. I mean, I just, you've heard me say this a dozen times, but the thing of it is, it it makes me cringe to no end to see how how that modern church a lot of times uses the Bible for nothing more as just one of the props that goes along with the decorations in the sanctuary. No, this is, this is the main thing. We're going to build our life on what it says in this book. If we didn't have what it says in this book, we'd all be lost. Bible says that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now, in other words, everything that we have a hope of going to heaven based on is in the Word. Get it, get it in your heart. Read it. Man, you guys got children. I know, I, know it's a, I know it can be a real stressful thing to try to get kids to listen to have a devotion at home and all that stuff, but you need to try. I mean, we have Sunday school classes and we have Sunday school teachers and we try to have capable Sunday school teachers and children's church and all that stuff where, where people are, are confronted with the Bible. I got a little bit too much monitor up here. Uh, so I'm sounding like I'm in a joke. Too much, uh, too much non-essential nonsense has killed a lot of churches I'll tell you something, I'm not trying to, I ain't trying to be a smart aleck, but I'll tell you what. Um, there's too many preachers that have, have forsaken the word and just get up there and talk about issues of the day and a bunch of current events and, and dumb stuff like that. Now, I'm not saying, that, I'm not, don't misunderstand me now, I bring it in. Illustrations, man, I love them. I, I, you know, I, I think that, that, that you know, one of the first things about preaching is it ought to be interesting, but it has to be based on the Bible. And people need to get the truth settled in their hearts. So, I, sometimes I, I have my homiletic students just try, try to consider the needs of others as more important than your own. Now, that'll help you to know what to do. What other people need more than what you need. Because self-sacrifice is a very important part of being a Christian. I, I, I always we memorize this verse in my homiletics class. It says in Philippians 2, 4, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. That means that it doesn't, it doesn't say that, that, um, that it's not okay to watch out for yourself or to look out for yourself. That's all right. You got to look out for yourself. But it, but it, it's saying there that don't just do that. Be sure you watch out for others, for the needs of other people. It's telling us that selfishness is sin. It's deadly. Selfishness is an attitude that is totally unlike Christ. When it, says, when it says, look not every man on his own things, but also on the things of others, it goes on to say, and let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's what it says. Now, now sometimes I, I have my homiletic students memorize uh, that verse and, and, uh, and do sermons on it. And I can't, I can't ever 
state the importance of, of, the, of that principle too much. I mean, to consider the needs of others as being more important than your own. I mean, that's what Jesus did when it says he made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, made in likeness of men. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess. So self-centered, one way, hard-hearted approach to life. <coughs> that's, that, that, that's, that's the core beliefs of the moral reprobates in our, of our day. Self-centered. Selfish. It's, it's the part, <coughs> excuse me, of the Antichrist spirit. It's getting a hold of people. And, and we who claim to be Christians and believe in the Bible and all the, 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 the uh, things that the Bible teaches, we believe that the Bible is the all-sufficient rule of faith and conduct. And if we believe that, we need to put our foot down and just simply say, selfishness is a sin. Because it is. It is a sin. Let each esteem others as better than themselves. Work on that. It's tough on the flesh. Now try to realize how important it is for you to do the right thing. Okay? Did y'all... I know that's a simple statement I just made... But try to realize how important it is for you in any given situation to do the right thing. Why, Brother Taylor, would that be important? Because James 4.17, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. In other words, if you, if you know that there's the right thing that you could do in any situation and you don't do it, it's a sin. You don't have to go out and drink. You don't have to smoke a cigarette. You don't, you don't have to cuss somebody out. It's still a sin. Just to know that you should do good in this situation and you don't do it, it's a sin. Oh, y'all need, need to think about that. I mean, spiritual complacency is not just unfortunate, it's a sin. If you, if you know that you, that you need not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as a manner of some is, even more as you see the day. If you know you're supposed to go to church, you're supposed to go. And if you don't go, it's a sin. Y'all understand, understand and I'm, I'm not trying. I mean, it's not enough for you to not do the wrong thing. You got to do the right thing. That's very important to people. I, I, I want everybody uh, that's listening to me to start looking for ways to have a good impact on the world around you. Not just, not just say, well, I'm, you know, I'm going I'm to satisfy myself with the fact that I'm just not going to do anything bad and ain't going to hurt nobody or nothing. But... That's not, that's not enough. Look for things that are good that you could do. I mean, there's an old saying, charity begins at home. Well, that's a good place to start. Why don't you do some good things around the home? Huh? You know? Be nice, y'all young folks, be nice to mom and dad. Make life a little more easier for them. Huh? Husbands, wives, be nice to your spouse. Try to look out for them. See if you can come up with some things, you know, that you see that, you know, if I did this, it would make it, it, would make it better for them. What's everybody grinning about? Huh? I don't quit preaching and go on to meddling. Right? No, but it is. It's just, it's really important. Look for things. To, there's more. Uh, to do than you could get around to. And after you after you've done after the charity begin at home, move on to your friends and folks you go to church with. 
And then after you get, do it on the job. Try to, try to show Christian benevolence to people that you have to work around, you know, and just be around. How are we doing on this? I'm just, I'm, I'm almost done with it. But, but in other words, look for the right things to do and then press yourself and make yourself do it. How to know what to do. That's what I talked to you about. Find out what would be the most Christ-like thing I could do in any given situation and do that. That's how you know what to do. Uh, Brother Josh, somebody y'all come. I'm going to quit here. I told y'all, <laughs> I've been here a long time, so I probably told y'all a lot of times. But I still remember at my brother's church, Havis Crawford was preaching. And um, I can still see him, you know. Uh, Havis was quite a preacher. He's one of, one of, one of the fellows that I'd, I just like to listen to. He seemed like he could, he could uh, always get the milk and cookies down on the bottom shelf, you know, for guys like me to understand. And he was so interesting because he was so relevant. Just this homespun kind of way of talking to you about things really helped me. But I, I, you know, I remember uh, he was preaching one time at Ken's, and he was just he was just talking, and he said he said one time I got real discouraged, and I felt like giving up. Now that helped me right there just to know that a man of his caliber had come to a place where he felt like giving up, you know. And then I, I, it dawned on me as a very young preacher that uh, we all go through dark valleys sometimes. He said, I felt like giving up. And I just, he said, I just, I got tired of it. And he said, and, and, uh, and he said, but... He said, but I had a, a vision or a dream. He said, I, I don't know which it was. But he said, he said, all of a sudden, he said, I was surrounded by little eyes that was looking at me. He said, I saw all these little eyes out there in the dark. And the eyes were shining. I couldn't see the faces, but I could see all these little eyes around there. And he said, and the Lord spoke to me and said, that's all the little children and young people in the church that look up to you. And they got confidence in you. And if you, if you were to get discouraged and quit, it would devastate them. And I can still see, I can still see Havis. He was preaching at my brother's church, Brother Kirkman. And I can still see him with his hands like this. And he said, I could see them little eyes. Well, them little eyes are on you. And I've, uh, I've told you all this before, but I'm going to tell you again. There's been times that I've got discouraged. There have been times I, I just, you know, I got to the point where I just really didn't know what to do and I didn't and I was tired of messing with stuff. You ever been there? <laughs> but when I thought about giving up, the first thing that come to my mind is 
what about my children? You know, I brought them up in the house of the Lord. I've been, I've been their pastor all their life. I've tried, to, I've tried to teach them what was right. I've tried to tell them, you know, you can make it through this. What would happen? What would, it, what would happen to them if all of a sudden I, I just cashed in, give it up? Huh? I'm not going to, I'm talking to you. You don't want to give the devil the satisfaction of pointing at you and using you as a bad example, especially as we get closer to the end. I don't know how much longer we got to do it, but we need to keep doing it as long as we can. And you're in here tonight, and the devil's been telling you, you might as well give it up. You know, it's not about anything. Look at all the stuff's falling apart all around you. He's a liar and the father of it. He's always been that way. They're telling you, well, you know, you, you did this and that, and it didn't turn out good, and you've got, you've got either children or, 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 or other people in your family that they're not living for the Lord like they need to be living for the Lord. Well, I'm telling you what, you're giving up ain't going to help that none. You gotta hold fast the profession of your faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised, and yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. But now the just shall live by faith, and if any man draw back, my soul had no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. How you know what to do, Brother Taylor? I know that I'm not going to do what the devil wants me to do. I know that much. I know that heaven's going to be worth whatever it takes to get there. And I know that God is faithful. And if you'll do what you can, He'll do what he can. And there's always so many somethings that God can do. I want you to lift your hands right here. I feel like God trying to help somebody tonight. You need a little encouragement to know uh, what to do. And uh, I, I tried to tell you just, I don't like to oversimplify things, but you just do what pleases him. That's what Jesus did. Wasn't easy. They crucified him for it. But he did what he knew pleased the Father. And it turned out good for him. And it's turned out good for a whole lot of other people that believe in him. And it'll turn out good for you if you just make your mind up. I'm going to do what the Lord tells me in his word to do. And if nobody else does it, I'm still going to do it. And if it looks like it's not working, I'm going to keep on doing it because I believe that God is faithful. Understand with me I'm all across the building now. This wound up, it took me a little longer than I thought it was. And I hope that it's not took y'all out too late. But we got time to pray around the altar. And some of y'all got some stuff you need to pray about and ask the Lord to fortify your soul to just keep doing what you need to do and not get discouraged and not give up. Just keep doing what you need to do. So I just want you to come. Find your place to pray, everybody that will.
found in his likeness to hear him say well done someday I just want to please the Lord be in his will in every way to be lost in his presence found in his likeness to hear him say well done someday there are trophies to be won success is there to gain some would give their very soul to reach earth's highest plane but to count this gain would be my loss if I lay down commitment's cross So I lift mine eyes toward things above And serve them with a heart of love I just want to please the Lord Be in His will in every way to be lost in his presence found in his likeness to hear him say well done someday oh I just want to please the Lord be in his will in every way found in his likeness and to hear him say well done someday there are trophies to be won success is there to gain some would give their very soul to reach earth's highest plane But to count this gain would be my loss If I lay down commitment's cross So I lift my eyes toward things above And serve them with a heart of love I just want to please the Lord Be in His will found in his likeness to hear him say well done someday my plans had all been made since die already cast the world was at my fingertips I thought I'd arrived at last but the crime could not be pacified With a heart about to break inside Jesus showed himself to me He said, just look what you could be Now I just want to please the Lord found in his likeness and to hear him say well done someday oh I just want to please you Lord be in your will in every way I want to be lost in your presence found in your likeness and to 
hear you say well done someday Jesus, to be like Jesus. 